Welcome to Yahoo Finance Presents. I'm Adriana Belmonte, and my guest today is Representative Katie Porter of California. Congresswoman, it is so great to have you here. To start off, you know, you've been pretty outspoken about the American healthcare system, specifically the role of pharmaceutical companies and our drug pricing system. So I'd love to know what was it in particular that piqued your interest in this area? I'm a lifelong consumer advocate. I was a professor teaching consumer protection before I ran for Congress. And I believe strongly that people should get what they pay for. And that is absolutely true when we as um, customers are paying health insurance premiums or when we as taxpayers are paying the government. And in the case of both big pharma and big insurance, consumers and taxpayers are getting ripped off. So, you know, just to dive a little bit deeper into that, would you say that's probably the biggest issue within our drug pricing system or does it go even deeper than that? The larger framework for understanding what's wrong with healthcare is that we don't have a competitive market. I'm a champion for capitalism, but that means we have to have things like price transparency. You can figure out what things cost. Competition. There are more than one person or more than one company selling drugs. Um, and we don't have those things in our healthcare system. We don't have a healthy market. And that's why we see drug companies being able to engage in this price gouging. And a big part of the problem here is with the federal government itself. We need to change the law to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices. There's no mystery here. Pharmaceutical companies have told us they charge Medicare more because we're not allowing the government to negotiate those drug prices. And who ends up on the hook? It's not just patients, but all of us as taxpayers. So why is it that, you know, in 2022, Medicare still can't negotiate drug prices? And what kind of, I guess, legislation could specifically fix this situation? What we're short on here is not legislation. We're short on political backbone and the will of elected representatives, particularly Republicans, to stand up and do something about this. Congress passed, the House passed, um, to last Congress, the HR3, the Lower Drug Prices Now Act, and there are a large number of bills in Congress that would allow Medicare to negotiate. There are different ways to do this in the details, but the basic premise is the same. We need to have those market forces operating. And so what I see over and over again is when we come down to those tough votes, there are a lot of people who are not willing to step up and actually be on the side of taxpayers and be on the side of patients. And so I think it's really important that people ask their representatives, where do you stand on lowering drug prices? How did you vote on this issue? Do you take corporate PAC money from big pharma? And does that change your position? So pharmaceutical executives, whenever they're confronted about price major price increases. I know, for example, insulin, the price of insulin has increased substantially. Uh, I think a recent report came out to back that. You know, they try to, they argue that the, these prices are necessary for research and development, what we know as R&D. But you've kind of refuted that in the past. So why is it specifically that you disagree with that assessment? The facts are very clear. Big pharmaceutical companies spend many multiples more on stock buybacks to line the pockets of their shareholders than they do on reinvesting in their companies in life-saving cures and diseases. Everybody should want us to have innovative care, but it doesn't do any good to develop those drugs if they're priced out of reach. More importantly, who does the basic science research that makes breakthroughs, whether it's cancer drugs or COVID vaccines possible? It's us as the federal taxpayers. We fund that basic science research and drug companies have a role to play in bringing it to market. But there simply is no set of facts that supports that allowing the government to negotiate drug prices would reduce innovation. If anything, Having a more competitive market would put a premium on companies who do put the resources that they earn, the profits that they earn back into inventing the next product rather than excess profit price gouging going to line their shareholders' pockets. So billionaire Mark Cuban launched a drug company earlier this year. His goal was tr uh, price transparency with consumers and basically trying to help them find the lowest uh, cost possible for their medications. So what are your overall thoughts on an approach like this where it takes, you know, a high profile, high net worth individual to step in 
I mean, does this help the issue at all or is it kind of just, you know, just scratching the surface? We definitely want people to draw attention to this and to push back against industry talking points that are hollow of fact that we cannot have the best quality healthcare in the world at a reasonable price that puts it in the reach of American patients. And so I think the more that we can see innovation in this marketplace, the better, but we can't lose sight of the fact that you can't innovate your way around a legal ban on the government being able to negotiate the things that it purchases, in this case, drugs for seniors. That's a legislative problem, and we have to tackle that alongside these other innovators who are trying to bring down prices for patients. So shifting gears a bit here, you've also been pretty outspoken about preventing lawmakers from trading individual stocks while they're in Congress. Your bill in particular, I know there's been quite a few pushed out um, from various Congress people, but your bill in particular would not only ban uh, lawmakers from doing so, but also the president, the vice president, Supreme Court justices, and even some officials of the Federal Reserve. So why is that so important to include these individuals and would you support a bill that ends up only applying to lawmakers? Our democracy is only as strong as the people's trust in government. And that is true about the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the administrative branch. So I think bans on stock trading need to apply to all branches of government. I think Congress has a special duty to hold ourselves to the highest standards. So I strongly support moving quickly with a ban on Congress people trading stocks. Um, and I think we need to make sure that it's robust. This cannot be a hollow disclosure policy. It needs Needs to be a strong substantive ban on either trading or owning. We have rules right now that say when Congress members trade stocks, they need to make those disclosures. But what we've seen from both sides of the aisle is a failure to follow the rules that we establish for ourselves. So Congress comes back next week and you know, there's folks like Elizabeth Warren. I know that you two have been close for a long time. Uh, they've been talking about trying to get at least a slimmed down version of Build Back Better passed. And they said that, you know, this kind of needs to happen or else the Democratic Party is going to be in trouble with the upcoming midterm elections. So what level of optimism do you have in hoping at least something gets passed uh, as Congress returns? And do you think policies particularly aimed at child care and working parents will be included? Whether I'm working in Washington, D.C. or working here in California, my constituents' challenges in paying for child care, in worrying about gas prices and wanting more clean energy, um, in making sure that we have a strong economy where they can afford to pay for medication, for example, these problems don't go away just because Congress fails to deliver. So I think the American people need to continue to press their representatives to solve problems. And those problems have to include addressing climate change, bringing down costs for American consumers with regard to childcare and drug prices. And so I think any legislation that we pass should have those core principles. The solution to the challenges families are facing can't be to lower wages. It has to be to reduce costs. And we have that tool right there in front of us with passing some of the key elements of the existing legislation that we put forth last Congress, the Build Back Better Act. And how quickly do you think this needs to be achieved, given the fact that it is a crucial election year? Look, for me, it's not about election years. It's about families and what they're struggling with. We want to see a strong, stable, globally competitive economy that benefits every voter, regardless of their party preference. And that's what I'm going to fight for in Washington. So we have an economy that is seeing some challenges in terms of inflation, but also seeing some strengths in terms of job growth and stock market. And it's our job to deliver the remaining pieces of policy to strengthen that economy. So the sooner we do that, the more we're putting our economy in position to be able to weather whatever the future holds. And I have to ask you while I have you here, you've become pretty well known for utilizing a whiteboard during a lot of congressional hearings. So what was it that inspired you to start utilizing this? And you know, have, have you seen any benefits that uh, have come from it? 
Well, I think the most important obligation that I have as a representative is to get information, to answer the questions and then answer the problems that are on the mind of my constituents and then share with them what I'm learning. I was a teacher before I ran for Congress, so I spent a lot of years standing in front of a whiteboard. And when you have a student who can't quite get to the answer, when you have someone who didn't do their homework, you turn to the whiteboard to help make it more clear. And so I think about the whiteboard as a teacher teaching tool. The American people are owed answers from their government, and the whiteboard is a way to help it make it easier for everyday people to understand what Washington's getting done or not getting done to solve their problems. All right, Representative Katie Porter of California, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much.